Hello everybody and welcome to the next recording of our working group meeting on mathematical optimization and quantum computing. We will go on with uh, Matthias Koch and William Stedman, uh, both from, or one from the DB Sistel and the other from DB Net again. And uh, Matthias Koch has a background in physics. Uh, he has a PhD uh, at the, did his PhD at the Fritz Haber Institute uh, of the Max Planck Gesellschaft, where he also worked as a group leader. And uh, he joined last year DB Sistel as a research engineer uh, to evaluate the use of quantum algorithms inside uh, the Deutsche Bahn. And his co-speaker, William Stedman, um, has a background in mathematics and worked as a algorithm developer and uh, further also developed multi-objective mixed integer models at two different uh, companies. And also last year he joined the DBNets uh, in Berlin as an operations research expert. And now he's um, evaluating how to integrate quantum algorithms in mixed integer models. So we welcome you and you will speak about the uh, quantum optimization for the train timetable problem. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for, for having me here. I'm, as, as you already mentioned, I'm working for, for, that's, for that icon, which is which every German speaking person, or at least everyone who lives in Germany knows, it's the, the Deutsche Bahn. And the question I would ask myself would be why, does, why is the German Bahn or Deutsche Bahn interested in, in quantum optimization or optimization? Because you might think, probably I don't have to explain this here, but you might think it's just getting people from A to B. That's, that's, that's all what you need to do. But in reality, there's a lot of optimization going on inside the Deutsche Bahn. So they have to, to do the, the position of the trains, so the scheduling of the trains, which should take which trips. They have to, if they've decided which train should operate which trip, they have to decide which infrastructure they should use, which staff should operate the trains. And if something breaks, who should prepare the train and so on and so forth. So there's a huge optimization problem inside Deutsche Bahn, which I think is as important, as big as the, the, the regular operation of, of the train network itself. And, and this, this, the, the size of this problem is humongous, for, which, is, which is good for all the mathematicians which work at DB because they have very interesting problems to solve. And as part of this new program in, in, in Germany, which says mehr Trassen, mehr Züge, mehr Mitarbeiter, which means something like more infrastructure, more trains and more staff to make the, 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 the railway system compatible and as one of the, the major players for sustainable transport. Um, for, for, for that reason, a lot of money will be invested in, in Deutsche Bahn, but just buying more resources won't solve the problem. You also need to allocate the resources in a quite clever way and do optimization to, to get out of most of, 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 of your, of your um, of, of the resources which, which, which you have available. And this is precisely what we are trying to investigate. So we don't try to investigate this in a way that we try to solve the classical problem. So we work on a tiny scale, on, on tiny scale problems compared to the, the proper mathematicians at, um, at DB. But we are allowed to check out the, the quantum advantage for such um, algorithms. And this is funding. The funding comes from Planck. This is a research project in Germany where industry is um, brought together with academia. And we can study mainly um, um, artificial intelligence. So how to use quantum algorithms to boost artificial intelligence. But the second project is, and this is also the project I will talk about today, is on quantum optimization. So how can we use quantum algorithms like Kubus and Quava and quantum annealing for optimization tasks? And now I would come back to, to my, my introduction, which means using trains in a clever way, because this is more important than you might think. So the general problem which we are looking or the toy model problem which we, which, which we are investigating is we have a timetable and we want to operate this timetable with a certain set of trains. But we don't want to just operate the timetable in no, no matter what, but we want to operate in the most efficient way, which means have as little deadheads as possible. So train rides, this is, this is train talk. These are, um, these are um, 
train rides without guests. So we want to minimize them and we just want to do operations where we actually bring guests from, from A to B. And then the second thing we would like to include in, in our model is that we have to comply with maintenance. So this means every certain amount of, or after a certain amount of kilometers, we have to drive with each train to a service station where, for example, the cert certain pieces are checked. I think German would be Laufwärtsnachschau. This would be one of the things which you have to check, I think, with, which you have to check after um, 80,000 kilometers, if I remember correctly. But also more important, this is now bringing you back to the clevers to control the, the, the timing between two trips. So the type block, this is how MDB Fernverkehr would call it. This is the time between two trips taken by one train and you try to maximize them. Because by controlling this, this stopover time between two trips, you can make the train table more robust. If you have a delay, for example, it won't in fact, in fact, um, influence the, the remaining um, schedule of the trains. But also, if you're really clever, you can make them that long that if you have, for example, a technical problem with the train nearby, you can use that train, which is not in use because of this long type block. Or this, um, yeah, because of this long type block, this one takes over the trip of the defective train. And if it's just a small problem, you can fix it, for example, a broken door. And then this train takes the trips of the replacement train. And this can really boost the performance of, this is one of the examples how you can boost the performance of the, the Deutsche Bahn company. But the problem is humongous, what I mentioned already before, because just for DB Fernverkehr, which is the smallest um, company, or the, which has the, the least number of trains in, in Deutsche Bahn, they have already 300 trains. And I don't know how many trips they operate each day because I couldn't find that number. But to give you an example, there, uh, there are already 60 trips just between Berlin and um, Hamburg each day. So if you now map the number of trains on the number of trips, the, the, the resulting number will be huge and probably larger than I even can imagine. Just the, the possibilities how to combine these two problems. And this is where quantum optimization could bring an advantage, or we hope that it brings an advantage, because you will have a quite complicated optimization structure or, 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 or potential landscape. As not, not as shown here, because it's still quite simple, it's just two parameters. But there, the tunnel effect might help that you get better solutions in, in, in less time. And what's shown here, I don't think I need to explain it, it's just the, the cost function plot for, for two variables. And you have these peaks and you have these valleys. And I'll just explain it briefly because I will use it later. And where these peaks are, the cost function is not set, or the, 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 the penalties and the constraints are not satisfied. For example, train which need to be maintained will operate a trip, which should never be the case. For that reason, there's a, there's a huge peak. On the other hand, here you have a valley. This is a technically correct version, uh, version of the timetable, but it might not be efficient if you had the upper side of that valley close to the plateau. Here, many deadhead rights will still occur. Just if you get down there, you might even get a robust timetable. But ideally, you would not be in a local minima or minimum, you would be in the global minima. And for that reason, tunneling could jump in. And this might be able to connect your different minima so that the optimizer can jump from one to the other. The price is the cubo, what yesterday was introduced really nicely. So I don't think I need to explain this after, after, after these nice introductions, but what we have to use as a corset. And now I would change gears and start with the, the first formulas, but this is a pretty simple one, just to, sh but it will become important later on in the talk. So this is the, 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 the main formula where I will focus on for this talk. And this is the maintenance conference constraint, which says, a, a train should not drive more than it's allowed to drive before it has to go to a service interval, uh, to, to a service station. And this can be, this inequality can be written as inequality if you add a slack variable and then I can reformulate it and I get this term. And here the slack variable is now a number from zero to maintenance interval. I don't, I, I probably don't have to explain this here because I guess they're mainly experts in, in, in the session, 
but this select variable is chosen by the optimizer. So this, this optimizer chooses the select variable in a way that this equality is always true. So this means if the train has not been used at all, driven kilometers is zero, select variable will be equal to maintenance interval. And if you sum the two, two up, it, you will have zero. If you have driven two kilometers, the select variable will be maintenance interval minus two. And then if you have the train has driven as much as the maintenance interval is, the select variable will be zero. And since this is always zero, I can square it. And for that reason, only I get a penalty only then when the main event driven kilometers extend the, the maintenance interval. And as then, as soon as this happens, I get a, a squared penalty. But for the, because of that formulation, the driven kilometers need to be linear because I have a square here and I can only implement quadratic terms without additional slack variables. So this means ideally I have a version of writing this where I can combine the each where I just sum up over each trip. So for example, these are the colors here now. If I have a trip from Munich to Frankfurt, and then afterwards from Hamburg to Munich, I need to sum up over the driven kilometers here and the driven kilometers here. But I also need to have include the data between Frankfurt and Hamburg because this is quite, quite an amount of, of kilometers between these two operated trips by that train. And for that reason, I need to have this combination of trip, subsequent trip. And we realized this in the graph model. This is shown here. So this is now the, the, the overlaying structure of our mathematical formulation, where we have each trip, for example, Berlin Frankfurt with ID one. And then we combine these trips with the subsequent trip, which is operated afterwards, for example, Frankfurt Hamburg, Mainz Fulda or Frankfurt Mainz with these IDs. And then we have that assignment variable, the trip next trip train. And if for, for a certain example, this would be if a train operates, is there a question or? Okay, if, if, if a certain train operates the first trip, the third one, one three would be equal to one. If the train operates the first trip and the fourth trip, I x1 and x4 would be one, and the other two would be zero. But if a trip operates, if a train operates trip four, there needs to be also trip after trip four. So you can go on like that. So this means also another variable needs to be one, which starts with four, and then the train up the trip afterwards would be would be six, and then there's another one with six would, would appear, and so on and so forth. So this gives you and you have assigned all the trips to trains, this gives you a sequence of operations of, of, of your, this gives you a sequence of trips which are operated by the trains. And then we use the second modeling trick for the maintenance, because here we don't want to have a second variable. We just want to include them into the trips. So instead of having this variable, we have an optional trip, which does not have to be operated, but instead of starting at the, the regular station, in this case, Berlin, it starts at the service station, then the maintenance is performed, then there's a dead head to Berlin, and then the actual trip is operated. And this makes the model slightly easier. We have just two types of variables, which will be important later in this talk. So we have the trip assignment variable, and we have the slack variables for the maintenance. And mathematically, it would look like this. Please ignore the right side. So this is just there for completeness. So the most important function is that one here. This is just the sum over all operated trips. What it says is if the train set operates trip F1, this will become one. And then the sum, if a train set operates many trips, then the sum becomes large. And because there is a minus sign, the value will get really deep. So this, is, this, this one here is making the valley as deep as possible. But there are two constraints which, which are important which you want to mention. So the first one is the maintenance constraint here in the linear version now, because I know which trip is operated first and which one's operated afterwards. So I can just sum over the trips of a certain train and sum up the length for each trip. And then the dead head length from the final station of the first trip to the starting station of the second trip. And this sum needs to be smaller than the maintenance interval. And in case this number is smaller than that one, I have the slack variables to fill up that equation to make it zero and then I square it. The second one is for ordering the trip sequence. This one is shown here. 
So you have F1, F2, first trip, second trip. If there is no second trip operated by the train, this would give me a penalty. If the second trip is operated by the, tra by, by the train, one of these Xs would become one. And I, I would get a zero for the, for the brackets. And you might ask now, what happens if there are two or three trips operated starting from F2? This is not possible because of these constraints. So it's always possible, but I, I penalize it hard with these constraints so that only one F2 trip can flag up with, with one. And now we'll switch to the results. So we have tried this model on, on two different bridge technologies. One is the D-Wave with 5,000 qubits. The other one is the Fujitsu with 100,000 qubits. Well, I think we, we, used, we, we calculated it on the 2,000 qubit version, actually. And the solution for that model is shown on the right-hand side. And I would just walk you through quickly. So this is now for the train IDs. So here the trains are plotted. Here's the time. And here are the trips. And what you can see is, for example, for train 30, I start counting by zero. The um, trip 28 is operated first from Frankfurt to Berlin, afterwards 24. And luckily, here's also 24. So this is now train um, 13 operates trip 24 from Berlin to Frankfurt. And you always find this combination of first trip, second trip for 32, 32, 34, 34, 88. So this ordering or the sequencing of the trips seems to work in this model. And what you also might notice is the 60 at the end. And this is a, 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 an encoding for um, stop of operation or end of, end of business for that day. So this is the final trip. And this is why the 60 occurs for each train during the whole um, um, op a timetable, optimized timetable. And if you calculate now the um, the operated trips is a function of the input operated trips. So here a train can take five trips, 10 trips, 15 trips, and how many it finds in the solution. You see that the Fujitsu and the D-Ways perform pretty bad, pretty good compared to the ideal solution. And I haven't tried heavily to improve the D-Way. So this is, I think the solution is good. Maybe you could even get it better if you try harder. Because I was more interested in actually confusing the D-Way. So what, what I was interested in next was to use the slack variables to reduce the solution quality. Because what I've, what I've noticed, if I, if I try to optimize the same problem with two and six slack variables, I will explain in a second what this means. The, the train table looks completely different, the optimized one. So it should be the same. So the model is, so that the result should be completely the same. But instead, the, the result is much sparse. So less trips are operated, and even a few trips overlap. And this is a no-go because this means um, some constraints have been are not satisfied. And what I mean with six slack variables is shown here. So what I what I do, I create an artificial scenario where I say each trip that optimizes has a certain length. I, I don't care about the, the real length. And I say, for example, each length is four. And then the other thing what I say is that the maintenance interval is twice the length. So each train can operate two trips before needing to go to maintenance. And then what the optimizer needs to do is it needs to adapt the slack variables in a certain way that this constraint up here is satisfied. So for example, if a trip, um, if a train operates only one zero trips, the first three here, one, two, and three need to be zero. And slack variable four needs to be one. If it operates one trip, slack variable three needs to be one. The other ones need to be zero. And if um, it operates two trips, all of them need to be zero. So what, what, I, what I get now is the combination of a need to guess the proper solution for the timetable problem. And then if I have that, I need to guess the correct answer for the slack variables. And this correlation is, I think, confusing for the for the for the for the for the annealers. And this is what you've seen, what, what you see here. And then I, I, since this happened, I was interested how's the QP performing. So let's make the problem small enough, like Elizabeth mentioned yesterday, that it fits on the QPU. And because then I should really benefit from the tunneling process and I should benefit from, from a better solution quality. So I made this problem which is tiny, five trips, 
retrains. This needs 45 qubits only. And then the select variables come on top of it, which is three times the maintenance interval log two. And without select variables, the QPU finds the proper solution, which is four trips can be operated by these three trains. And then it just artificially increase the, the number of select variables by increasing the length of the trips and the maintenance interval. So the solution should, should stay completely the same, just the more select variables to guess correctly. And this is now for simulated quantum annealing. Thanks, thanks to Williams, he showed me um, OpenJRJ, where I can um, implement this rather easily. And up here, the select variables were shown. So for two, three, four, and five select variables. And what you see here is the solution quality is the same, independent of the number of trips. Ah, sorry, wrong direction. Um, this is now for the hybrid leap. Again, the solution quality is not changing. Always four trips are found for all the trends. And this is now the QPU of D wave for this tiny problem, which doesn't need to be decomposed. And here it looks more like guessing or even worse than guessing because um, many trains overlap, uh, many trips overlap for the same train. So the um, constraints are not satisfied. Just here, it's not, not a good solution, but at least the correct solution is found. And what I've thought now, okay, this was just one run, 80 seconds, maybe it was not enough. Let's increase the annealing time. And also for extended annealing times, the solution quality is better, but not much better, because you see that there are again conflicts for these two solutions. But more importantly, what I can't show here, but I've repeated these, these optimizations or simulations quite a few times, and the results were most of the time rather random. So I thought, okay, let's try another thing. Let's do really a lot of ones. Let's, let's, let's repeat the same the same optimization, in this case, 20,000 times and see what, what's the result. And even then, the solution was not as good as um, for, the, for the classical version, so the leap hybrid version from D-Wave or the simulated quantum annealing. And with this, I would come to the last slide of my, of my talk, which is um, shown here. So you can see now the... Um, Solution quality is a function of the trips operated for different slack variables for the D-wave with for the hybrid D-wave. And here the quality is not really influenced by the number of slack variables. And now we'll come to the to the summary. So thanks first of all for your attention. I hope I could show you that the cubo formulation for the timetable problem or these the position problems with the position problems with yes and no work really well. I think it's it's pretty nice. Also, this stopover integration, which is a soft constraint to make the timetable more robust, can be implemented really easily in the cubo. But the slack variable is not up here yet. And I want to thank my colleagues from David Sistel and from Fraunhofer. Now we will hand over to your uh, colleague, William Stadman. Uh, who will give another part of, of a presentation. Thanks. Sure. Um, I think I have also the same slides, just continuing. I'll try to, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so uh, so what Matthias presented was kind of based on, you know, experimental or you know, practice with the uh, quantum annealer. Uh, I work in Dave A. Nets. Um, I'll, I'll just go down to the next slide. But we're playing kind of a follow-up study, but this would be a bit more long-term. And so I'd initially planned to actually discuss uh, some results uh, based on this weighting distribution, which uh, I think Marika and Elizabeth so nicely presented. But I have switched this to talk a little bit more about a theory idea that we will be uh, investigating in the coming months. So I'll just say this may be a bit more academic than industry, but uh, I hope I'll kind of provoke interesting thoughts and so forth. Um, just as an alternative method, okay? Um, just a little bit, uh, as Matthias kind of mentioned, there's kind of this question of the strategy at Deutsche Bahn, and I work in Dave Nets, particularly in this uh, section called Digitale Schiene Deutschland. And just kind of very briefly, this is a project within Dave Nets. So Dave Nets operates all the trains. So once the trains have, you know, had their timetable, then we would be the ones that would navigate it through the network to make sure that we can maximize the capacity. And to do that, we're gonna roll out a bunch of different technologies. So there's this new type of signaling, 
uh, GPS and other options for localization, 5G, AI, really a whole bunch of different technologies, but for a long-term date of 2030. Um, and so the idea is really to have this integrated transition so that uh, at least for a modeler, it's nice that we don't have to uh, model all different types of infrastructure, but that we would just have this new package that we could put into some uh, new uh, uh, model. And so as I say, with a target date of 2030, from our view, this NISC concern, this near intermediate uh, is less of an issue if we can come up with some approach that we believe will be you know, very viable by 2030. So that's part of the reason why, why it, I think as Matthias was mentioning, we have a kind of a strategic question of, we're not a customer right now, but we will be a customer kind of building up in preparation for 2030. And so, yeah, very much focused now on kind of ideas and architectures and kind of wanting the research to figure out, you know, in preparation, what will be a viable then. Um, yeah, so just a little bit on kind of railway uh, theory. Um, so all those new technologies um, are coming out to enable what's called this, to go from what's currently called fixed block to a moving block. So uh, what's fixed block is on the left here and you have kind of just labeled that as a train, you know, passes through part of the, the infrastructure, you know, it occupies a certain part of that infrastructure highlighted in the gray. And there are different parts that, you know, reasons for why it occupies that. So I kind of going from top to bottom, I have it there's the route set up eventually to the approach, the traversal actually going across it may only be a small part, a significant part, but not the whole part. And then you clear and buffer. And so this process takes some time. And right now this is done with these uh, fixed length blocks. But with the new technology, what we want to do is have much, much shorter effective blocks to the point where it's called this moving block, where basically wherever the train is, it would request permission to have sufficient uh, distance right, going out into the network, and then it would release that. Um, and to do that, I have to say, you know, we kind of go from this world where we can't do these blocking constraints, where you just say one train is in a block, but we need to have kind of a more complicated constraint to go along an edge. So if we were modeling this, we can't just have, you know, a thousand blocks per edge. And so just doing that um, with kind of this mixed integer approach, we're right now collaborating with LBW optimization, uh, just on a moving block model. Just want to give them uh, some credit there, shout out. Um, and this actually would be a flow-based approach, um, part due to, uh, I guess, all the constraints we have as we go through the network. So then we would uh, basically, uh, add these new constraints uh, coming in as we resolve different uh, conflicts detected through our moving block uh, kind of headway constraints. But just generally, I wanna say, regardless, we need new approaches, new models, because once we go from fixed blocks to moving block, we just need a whole bunch of new models anyway. Um, so in that idea of kind of looking for inspiration from this, I wanna kind of focus on the train dispatch uh, problem. So this is, I say, we have a timetable but we want to navigate exactly uh, how the trains would move through the network. And also if there's you know, disturbances or changes, how we would resolve that, how we could resolve the delays. And so just a little bit to explain this, um, each train here is a job, right? And we're trying to go through uh, each part of the network and we have this machine that would be each block in kind of the traditional theory, okay? So that would be like for Bob example C there, it goes through five, six, seven, eight, and then this star. So C has really these uh, um, one, two, three, four, five machines to go through. Um, I kind of put a strike through that because eventually, as I say, we're gonna have to modify this to make it more uh, complicated. So we would actually kind of have each train track as a machine. And then in a normal job shop shoveling with the blocks, you would say it's a blocking constraint, right? Only one, block can process one train at a time, but we will have to make this more complicated with this partially blocking where we would allow um, you know, two trains to go along the same track, but with some space, right? So when this um, machine completes one job, there's a certain gap between it can complete the next job. Um, but sticking with kind of this blocking approach to kind of to come up with our model or our theory, I want to present what's called this alternative graph. And this is really credit to uh, Dariano and Pecurelli. I have that uh, cited below here. The alternative graph here is to say, we have these solid arcs going from left to right, um, which are the, the time it takes to 
go across each block or each section, track section. So this is the running time, okay? And the first one, the 60, 105, 80, that would be like the initial time when we imagine BAC would enter this part of the infrastructure. So we go that across. And then at the very end, we actually take the subtract the total time. And so if there's no delay, what would come at the end would be zero. If you navigate kind of from the beginning to end, left to right on this graph, okay? But we have some synchronization. We have to say that, um, you know, as I say, at track uh, three, either A is in that block or B is in that block. And therefore there's these these dotted lines that represent that if you know if you follow the bottom path is zero, three, four to B, that's done. And then only after that's completed would A start at three, four, and continue through this path. And so in terms of delay, we want to do is we want to minimize the maximal delay, which is the make span if you consider all possible paths on this uh, this uh, diagram here. And where only one of the two dotted of every pair of dotted paths is active. Um, I'll say in this paper, they looked at some flexibilities, which is why there's this 115 minus delta here. I don't want to get too much into that, though to say that eventually we will have to consider somewhat more complicated graphs, and we would want to do this in some quantum uh, in an algorithm. I just want to point out the reason we're thinking behind this is um, each decision variable here, one arc is always active. And I actually think that will be an uh, promising for the quantum approach because we have this uh, spin glass, this one minus one, where regardless of the variable, it's having a contribution to the um, to the model, right? It's hard to actually have a, a variable that has no contribution. So just to say, kind of while we're focusing on the ordering as opposed to actually the routing uh, through the network at the moment. Um, so the question is, how can we get this into some sort of way that would eventually uh, work on a quantum device. And this is where it gets, I say, a bit more academic and kind of trying to think through this. And we have this problem here, which is we have two operations here. We have the running time. So I have a very simple example here. Say the running time is really just a sum. You take time where you're at, say this. So what I have here are the nodes. You can say you have kind of three blocks, A, B, then B, C, D, and then D, E, you could say, well, you take the time that you end one block B, C, D, plus the time it takes to traverse, uh, sorry, the time it takes to enter the block B, C, D, plus the time it takes to traverse it, that is then the time that you would enter block D, E, right? So that's a sum. The problem here is that the synchronization is a max operation, right? So we're saying either you would, it's the time you took, right, to traverse uh, just your path, or you had to wait for the other train, in this case, uh, train two, right, to clear this block. So I have here that same thing here, right? So the second pair of arcs on the right, that again, blue BCD to blue DE, it's either you just go along the top path or you had to go along the bottom path, wait until this block was cleared and then you could proceed. And so this actually are called these tropical or max plus operations uh, where you actually map the normal uh, multiplication to the sum and the norm, I'm sorry, this circle times is like the sum and the circle plus is like a max. And this is not quite like a, a field. We have this issue of inverses, but actually you have all these properties where it commutes, it's associative. And so it's a semi ring and you have a lot of uh, similar options. And so in fact, I can take the two pairs here of operations and really map it to a matrix operation here. So I had here, right, the time at BCD, time train two is at BD. And if you think about these matrix operations in terms of now circle times and circle plus, if you add these terms, that would give you these constraints here for um, time train one and train two arriving at DE. And this has also generally been noted in railway traffic, right? Um, just as I say, there's a paper on this, uh, how using these maxes and pluses to do this. And so I'm going to kind of say the idea here is to, we want to map it into this quantum circuit. And I'll give a brief introduction to this idea of tensor networks, which is a general way of representing these matrix operations. So it's just very convenient for multiplying lots of different operations. So if you think about it, you have these different nodes, kind of a vector has one index, so it has one edge or a leg, a matrix has two indices, so it has two legs. You could say a three tensor would have three edges, three legs. 
And then the multiplication of these is done by connecting these. So if you have here the blue and the uh, purple and that top example, that would be like a matrix times a vector. Or again, you would have a matrix times a matrix. And you can see here, what's happening is you're summing across one of the indices. So this J index is contracted, but you still have two indices at the edge representing the beginning and the end of this. And this is also related to quantum, uh, well, basically because every quantum gate is a unitary matrix. And so you can think of like a C naught gate because it has two uh, input uh, vectors or states, two output states. This would be like a four tensor node in this notation because we have two inputs and two outputs. And then there's some uh, tensor operation happening within this. And this is also how another analogy of this is with the Einstein notation. If people are familiar, you have these lower indices and upper indices, and that also tells you which of these indices are being contracted. So um, tensor networks are a way to represent many different quantum circuits. But as I said, I have specific different operations. And so there's this idea of tropical tensor networks. And this is again, where I say it's a bit more academic because it's a bit more quantum inspired than quantum. But the theory behind this is if you think about a zero temperature ground state, so you have this, this state here, which is the limit, because this, this is your inverse temperature as it goes to infinity or your temperature goes to zero, and you have this partition function, but within this, you have all these exponentials. And within these exponentials, right, if you take this limit, you take the sum of two exponentials, well, once they have a, let's say once, beta here is going to infinity, you have two very large exponentials, that's the max of one of these, as long as they're not exactly equal, but outside of that, it would be the max, right? Either it's beta x, e to the beta x, or e to the beta y, and then just normal multiplication, or sorry, multiplication of two exponentials, that would be the sum within the, um, within the exponent. And so there is a theory behind this, as well as say, there's no zero temperature quantum computers, but we can use the research in GPU accelerated libraries to simulate this and also to, um, I guess, to test this idea. And this is actually interesting kind of going from the other way where people are using this to um, model as I say, quantum system. So you take this zero temperature limit and we're using that to actually to solve like a, a quantum annealing problem or approximate it. And so here's just the representation of kind of your typical Isinglass as I say, between each of these, we have these H and J terms, which people have seen before in the, the Cubos or in the Hamiltonians. And these are then represented here within these, uh, these tropical operations, okay? So I guess just to kind of say the idea here, what we'd want to do kind of how we put it together is we would take one of these matrices and we now try to map this in our, to one of these, uh, these circuits or one of these tensor networks. And so I have just the kind of, instead of the slightly larger one, I took a smaller example here, really the simplest possible, uh, where you have two trains entering one node. And we have here again, as I say, this kind of this four uh, node behavior. So we have, right, the two trains entering, the two trains exiting, but then we also have this one control qubit to say which of these two arcs is active. So what we end up with would be this five, kind of five node tensor or five, five tensor. Um, and so that would be exactly, you know, one node in our network, but we could take that kind of example before and I kind of just diagrammically represented what it would be if you took all of those orders and you get with would be a hypothesized uh, network here to represent this. Now, to say this is very early, and this is what I will kind of be working on investigating is can we actually, you know, map all the needed operations in a way so that, you know, this makes sense? And I highlighted here kind of the operations that are in red here. Um, one thing, for example, as I mentioned, they had that stop. And as if you admit, have not fully worked out how we would work out the stop uh, within this whole model, but to say we could kind of come up with this model. And so this is kind of, I say, an idea to provoke some thoughts. Um, this is more an inspiration than a plan. Um, we may end up having that, we might need to approximate this, um, even if we can't get these exact operations uh, onto a quantum circuit or into these uh, quantum simulation. But I think basically the idea is here's another method to, um, to try to model it. 
and um, to kind of come up with an architecture that would work on a, a quantum device. Um, as I say, yeah, we need to check for all the different topologies in the railway network, that's what I mean, and all the general constraints. But one of the interesting things I would say here is this would be compatible with the alternative graph. So this would might be a way where we could um, combine really all these heuristics that we have already for this alternative graph approach in the literature with maybe uh, doing some of these operations on the quantum circuits. I guess maybe I should say, so I didn't think I mentioned before, kind of the idea here is what I had in this hypothesized network is we want to contract this rather complicated quantum circuit into a much simpler one. So you have here kind of all these different control bits and starting states, but we can, that's really all that's, you know, externally uh, dependent. So we could take small sections of our very large alternative graph and try to use quantum algorithms to understand how we would contract them. Um, yeah, I think I'm already probably took the time. So I will end here. I would welcome any questions or ideas. Um, yes. Thank <laughs> you.